Some scholars today take the position that the Bible is a biased book, and that it cannot be trusted without confirmed evidence from extra-biblical sources. In other words, the Bible is guilty until proven innocent, and a lack of outside evidence places a biblical account in doubt. The standard is hypocritical compared to other ancient documents, even though many, if not most, have a religious element. They are considered to be accurate unless there is evidence to show that they are not. Although it is not possible to verify every incident in the Bible, the discoveries of archaeology since the mid-1800s have demonstrated the reliability and plausibility of the Bible narrative. Here are just a few examples. In the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 6, we have an account of the Israelites defeating the city of Jericho when they came into the Promised Land after wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. According to the biblical account, the Israelites marched around the city once a day for six days. On the seventh day, they encircled the city seven times. On the final time around, the priests blew the trumpets, and the people shouted, and the walls fell flat. The archaeological evidence that validates this biblical event was a combined effort of both the German excavation team in the early 1900s and a British archaeologist in the 1950s. The first major excavation of Jericho was performed between 1907 and 1909. The excavation team found piles of mud bricks at the base of the mound the city was built on. Almost 50 years later, Kathleen Kenyon re-excavated the site with modern methods and proved that these bricks were from the city wall which had collapsed when the city was destroyed. The story in the Bible goes on to say that when the city walls collapsed, the Israelites stormed the city and set it on fire. Archaeologists found evidence for a massive destruction by fire, just as the Bible relates. The Bible says that Sarah, Abraham, Isaac, Rebecca, Leah, and Jacob were buried in Hebron, in a cave purchased by Abraham, Genesis 23. Traditionally, this cave has been located below the sacred precinct of the Friend of the Merciful One God in Hebron, today a Muslim mosque. References as early as the 2nd century BC testified that this is the authentic location of the burial place of the patriarchs. The cave was explored by the Augustan Canyons in 1119, at which time they found the bones of the patriarchs. Many of the people mentioned in the Bible are confirmed in sources outside the Bible. In the case of royalty, many times a likeness of the individual has been recovered. Over 50 persons named in the Old Testament are known outside the Bible, and we have likenesses of 12 of them. Some 27 people named in the New Testament are known from other records, with six likenesses surviving, four of them Roman emperors. Quite a number of biblical structures have been excavated. Some of the most interesting are the following. The Tower of Babel in Babylon, where language was confused, Genesis 11, 1, 19. The Pool of Gibeon, where the forces of David and Ishbosheth fought during the struggle for the kingship of Israel, 2 Samuel 2, 12-32. The theater at Ephesus, where the riots of the silversmiths occurred, Acts 19.29. Samson pushed with all of his might, and down came the temple of the rulers, of the Philistines, and all the people in it, Judges 16.29 and 30. Sodom and Gomorrah. The ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah have been discovered southeast of the Dead Sea. The modern names of Babadre, thought to be Sodom, and Numeria, thought to be Gomorrah, both places were destroyed at the same time by an enormous conflagration. The destruction debris was about three feet thick. Archaeologists discovered in the cemetery at Babab Dre that the buildings used to bury the dead were burned by a fire that started on the roof. The only explanation for this bizarre event is that the burning debris must have fallen on top of the building from the air. This mysterious event was clearly explained in the Bible and validated by archaeological findings. In Genesis 19.24, the Bible says, then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. The name of Israel's second king, David, appears in two 9th century BC texts, the Tal Dan inscription and the Moabite stone. Shishashk was the first Egyptian king to be mentioned by name in the Bible and the first foreign king in the Bible for whom we have extra-biblical evidence. The Moabite stone was an extraordinary find in its complete work. Joseph was Imhotep of Egypt. National Geographic, in January 1995, describes a man called Imhotep, who saved his country from a famine. Imhotep was the architect thought to be responsible for the idea of creating Pharaoh's tomb completely from stone. He was known as a sculptor, a priest, a healer, and considered to be the preeminent genius of the Old Kingdom. Once again, Imhotep had saved his country from a famine. There are many similarities between Imhotep and Joseph from the Bible.
Here are just a few. They both were second in command under Pharaoh. They both lived to 110 years of age. They were both great architects. They both stored up seven years of plenty. They both saw seven years of famine. They both interpreted dreams. They both built pyramids and palaces. They were both physicians. They both instituted an income tax of one-fifth. They both had a knowledge of astrology. They were both educated men. They were legendary historians. And both was one of twelve siblings. The Hebrew Exodus Expulsion of Hycasus lived around Averis in Egypt. In Egyptian documents and wall paintings, Joseph's court seal has been found in Averis. Also, A, cry out, to L, one of the first letters indicating the Hebrew God, has been found inscribed on Egyptian walls. Averis is also the location of Ramses, the place where the Israelites settled, Genesis 47:11, and where they departed from, Exodus 12:37. Miguel Yadin would complete the first proof of a biblical passage by finding the city gate of Gezer, which King Solomon built in 960 BC, and the Bible described in 1 Kings 9:15. In 2007, Nehemiah's wall was found. This discovery likewise caused a firestorm of activity among Bible skeptics who had continually pointed to the lack of archaeological evidence supporting the book of Nehemiah's claim that the returning exiled Jews rebuilt Jerusalem's city walls and restored the gates of the temple. In present-day Jordan, scientists have found a 10th century BC copper production center that coincides with the rule of the biblical king of Israel, King Solomon and his mines. A spike in metallurgic activity also coincides with the rise and influence of a rival tribe. This coincides with biblical description. The Dead Sea Scrolls One of the greatest finds in regards to the reliability of the Holy Scriptures was the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls. According to the Bible, the Old Testament was written between 1500 and 400 years before Jesus was born. Therefore, it is a great cause for faith when over 300 prophecies written between 1500 and 400 years before Jesus was born were fulfilled by him. Skeptics accused early Christians of altering the Old Testament just after Jesus' time in order to make it appear as though prophecies had come true. In 1947, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, it blew a hole in the skeptics' argument. The Dead Sea Scrolls contained all of the Old Testament books except Esther. Esther had no prophecy about the coming Messiah, so the hundreds of prophecies about Jesus are still there. The Dead Sea Scrolls were buried somewhere around 100 to 200 years before Jesus was born. We now have copies that predate the church by hundreds of years, but are word for word the same as our Old Testament. The Dead Sea Scrolls prove the Bible is authentic. The Bible has been proven. Time and time again, the mountain of evidence shows the Bible's narratives and detailed accounts were accurate and have been fully supported. Archaeology proves the Bible is true. Flavus Josephus, Demetrius, and Philo all said that it is in the ancient land of Midian, and those ancient historians said that it's the highest mountain in the region of Madian. So if they went around by the desert road, through the Red Sea, they would have come and gone to this 
mountain that's in Saudi Arabia. Am I sure about this? This is a pretty strong guess. When we talk about degrees of probability, this is probably the area that we're looking at for the real Mount Sinai. Could I be wrong? Absolutely. But it does have a lot of merit because it has the biblical uh, description. We have the uh, ancient historians, and it also has some unique uh, geological formations around it. For instance, um, as we go to this mountain, uh, we see that it's, uh, it's, it's the highest mountain in the region. There is a fence that's going around it today. I think that the Saudi government knows exactly what they have there. They put a fence around the mountain. You can see the barbed wire fence and the, the little shack there that is where the um, uh, little air-conditioned shack there is where they have the guards that are still guarding it today after all these years, since 1988. The top of the mountain is charred black. Uh, fascinating because God said he descended on the mountain like flames and of a furnace. So uh, I have shown this to geologists. They say, Bob, don't get excited, a little impetuous about you thinking that this could be where God descended on the mountain in flames of a furnace, because all the maps say that this is a volcanic mountain. I said, well, look at this rock. I broke this rock open, and there are jaws at the ground. This is granite on the inside, and it's melted black on the outside. Took this to the uh, American Museum of Natural History, and they said it's metamorphic, changed by heat and or pressure close to the surface. Now look at this mountain. You see the black on the right-hand side. It's not desert varnish. Then it stops and automatically becomes tan. So we have a very black, black rocks on the right side, and then it goes to tan. Is this where God's literally uh, presence came down and seared these rocks? Because it goes right from black to tan. There's no transition. It's just amazing. Uh, for you geologists out there, you might want to uh, talk to me afterwards. I have some samples we can look at. Now, here's this. Uh, there, there's an altar at the foot of the mountain. It's about 30 feet high and 30 feet across. You can see that there's a fence going around this. They know what they have here. Why would they put a fence around an old pile of rocks in the middle of nowhere? Uh, I think because they know what they have. Because if you look really close here, you can see on the side of this, the ancient bull god Apis and Hathor. Of course, they worshiped this god, and they made a golden calf. And you can see that it matches perfectly with the Egyptian artwork. So this, 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 these petroglyphs here, very ancient, uh, are matching with what the Bible says. The Bible says, went on Mount Sinai, Elijah pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Now, there's nothing exciting about a cave, but there's no cave at the traditional Mount Sinai. We have to realize that at that mountain, there's only one square yard per person where they could have camped. Archaeologists have dug that mountain up. The Israeli archaeologists had that for 16 years, didn't find one clay pot, not one bone, nothing to connect. Here we have all this evidence around this mountain. Here is this cave. This is where Elijah would have stood if this is the real Mount Sinai. Now, you can see there's plenty of space for them to have camped out there. The Bible says Moses built an altar at the foot of the mountain. Now, this is an ancient, very, uh, this, this Hebrew word is like when you push up against a screen, um, you get as close as you can. And so the camera is going to the right. And as we go right up against the mountain, I mean, you know, just within a foot, there is this altar that's 120 feet long. It has a center rock ridge in there. What does this rock ridge represent? Well, uh, first of all, there's no civilization ever lived anywhere close to this because of no water source. Um, this could be where they had the animals, where they ran the animals through this chute. And you can see this, this, this center rock ridge here. The animals would have been placed in there, slaughtered, and then we have an altar right next to it that's full of compressed ash. What is this? Uh, why is this important? Because the ancients, uh, in, 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 you know, over in the Muslims never did... Uh, any kind of burnt offerings, nor do they do it in modern times. But the ancient Hebrews did. They had a burnt offering ceremony where they would make a big, big fire and they would uh, slaughter and burn the animals upon the fire. The Bible says, and they set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Do we find pillars at this site? Keep in mind, there's no civilization ever has lived even close to this. And we have these white stone pillars. Now, you're not going to see the pillars right now. You see those white things out on the ground? Those are actually 
sections of pillars. How'd they make pillars in those days? They would take pillars and they would take pieces of stone, they would cut them and place them on top of each other. This is, ex this is Egyptian motif. It uh, doesn't have the flukes that, the, that the, the Greeks have or the knobs that the Romans would have. It's flat, rounded, and top, very similar to what the Egyptians. So they were Egyptian artisans for all intents and purposes because they were in the house of Pharaoh working as slaves. You can see these white stone pillars, surface located. Very interesting why they're surface located. Now, this is a couple named Jim and Penny Caldwell. They were over doing a remarkable work over into Saudi Arabia. Uh, they were working for Aramco. They heard about, you know, so they, they did their own research, and they heard a little bit about what we're doing and others that were doing research over there. And they went on their own and found what I think is the split rock at Horeb. Uh, while they were over there, uh, they had, uh, here's, here's Jim explaining. We have the sound down so I can narrate over this. We have to go really fast on this. But Jim is explaining here that his, he drove up, he saw this huge rock sticking up. Now look at this rock. You've got to understand, this thing is just sticking up. It's four stories high. It's not just a little knob. It's a four-story high rock, and the Bible calls it the rock at Horeb. In other words, you could see it for miles and miles around. Look at this thing sticking straight up, and it's split right down the middle. Uh, Moses, uh, the people cried out for water. Moses hit the, the rock and the rock split. You can see the lower left-hand corner where the hydraulics have blown away uh, some of the rock. You can see where it's fractured right down the middle. There's going to be another shot of it here in a minute. We'll just show that. Uh, when Moses was, uh, uh, the people were crying out for water. And so uh, uh, the people said, why did you bring us uh, up out of Egypt? to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst. They were pretty ticked off that he brought them there. And so it's so dry in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it was 128 degrees the day that we were there. You think it's hot outside? This was, this was pretty hot here. And so the people would have cried out for water. Moses hit the rock. Now look at this split right down the middle. This is amazing because you can see the lower left-hand corner of this. You see that big chunk that's blown away? Water has done that. Uh, there's only two ways to make erosion like this, wind and or water. This was by hydraulic source. Now the camera is going up. You can see that the, 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 it fractures from the bottom going up. This is not a, a pattern uh, that, is, that, that is typical of erosion, uh, usually from the top down. But you can see where the water has, at one time, water has come out of this. It actually, uh, you can see the, the, the carving, those black little holes at the bottom are like nozzles where the water had come out, shot out. Um, you can see the eddy to the left. You see it's smooth there where the water has swirled around. Then there was little dry waterfalls that came off this. So if this is the real Mount Sinai, then this is the rock that Moses struck. It split apart, and the water came out. And the Bible says the water gushed out. It didn't just trickle out. It was a burst of water that flowed down the mountain. Now, look at this mountainside. It's all washed smooth. You see this? There's no water in Saudi Arabia. You get a half an inch of rain every 10 years, and the whole mountainside is washed away. Look at these dry waterfalls here where the water would have come out and gone down the mountain. And, it, and that down below, you see that lake bed out there? That should be sand. That sand has all been washed away. There's no sand there. It's just because the hydraulic sources have washed away all the sand. You go to Saudi Arabia, it's all pretty much sand. So that is, uh, that is the search for Mount Sinai. Sorry it's so brief, but to get all the men...